Good afternoon, everyone. It is so nice to see so many students here today. I am delighted to welcome all of you here for the 2024 Lives in Public Policy and Public Service Address in the Calico School. This is the, uh, I believe, let's see, the eighth, no, the, uh, the eighth address for a school that was created in October 2015. It is the Peter S. Calico School of Government, Public Policy, and International Affairs. And we are so honored to have Peter S. Calico. Probably uh, the best title is Hofstra Class of 1965, here with us today. Please join me in giving him a round of President Poser is going to give the formal introduction in a moment. I am just going to give you a very brief history of this address, which was designed by the Hofstra faculty when we created the Calico School, which was announced in 2015, and then officially we started um, inviting the Creative Public Policy and Public Service Program in 2016. This lecture series was created to bring distinguished public leaders to campus to share their personal journey in pursuing a career in public service, focusing on their special challenges and their achievements. The purpose of this lecture, lecture series is to encourage and motivate Hofstra students to pursue your own passion for public service. Students in the Calico School Departments, which include anthropology, economics, global studies, history, philosophy, political science, religion, and sociology, and in Hofstra's interdisciplinary undergraduate public ma uh, major in public policy and public service, PPPS, for those of us in the know, are very keen to participate in the public sphere, whether it's through elected office, political appointment, or outside organizations that influence policy making. Over the years, we have started to invite alumni whenever possible to deliver this address. And this year, we thought, what better choice than the person who founded the Calico School, the Calico Center for Presidential Studies, and the chair of presidential studies. And I think I've got to introduce myself, I'm Professor Nina Bose of political science, and I hold those positions. So I am very grateful that we uh, have this opportunity today. We're so excited that we restricted this audience to three classes. We have the American Presidency course, that's my students here. Uh, we have the Public Policy and Public Service course, which is taught by Dr. Craig Burnett. Wonderful to see all of you today. And we have Dr. Andrea Labresco's Introduction to Civic Engagement course, and it's wonderful to have everyone here. We also have many faculty, distinguished guests. Uh, very pleased to welcome Trustee Jerry Kramer to join us today. We have members of the Calico School External Advisory Council, Chuck Catullo and Michael Lucivera. And I'm just going to make a special note how excited I am to see a Hofstra class of 2020 graduate, which I believe was the first full class that came in with the Public Policy and Public Service major, Ryan Layton. Um, I, we did his honors thesis on Zoom because of the pandemic. And so to have you back here today is very special, Ryan. Uh, I'm very grateful too to all of the distinguished university guests who are here. And of course, Mr. Rick Nasty from the Calico Company. We've worked together for a long time. Glad to have you here today. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to President Poser to introduce Peter Calico. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Nina, and, um, and welcome, everybody. This is a really exciting afternoon. Uh, thank you, Peter, for being here, and uh, Rick Nasty, Vice President, uh, sorry, Executive Vice President of the Calico Company, and also we are delighted to have Trustee Kramer here with us uh, as well today. Um, so it's my uh, honor, really, to give an introduction to Peter Calico, and I could spend the entire 90 minutes on that, so to you understand, I won't. I won't. Um, but uh, there's a lot to say. So Peter Calico is, uh, as you've heard, a 1965 graduate of Hofstra University and currently the president of H.J. Calico and Company, LLC, 
one of New York's leading uh, real estate firms. He began his career in real estate after graduating from Hofstra and became president of Calico and Company in 1973. He is the third generation to preside over the Calico uh, Company, a uh, family real estate company that started in 1925. Under Peter Calico's leadership, Calico and Company has developed <coughs> millions of square feet of commercial office space and constructed many prominent residential apartment houses in Manhattan. If there ever was an exemplar of how to combine a successful career in business with a life of public service and engagement in public policy, it is Peter Calico. He is the former chairman of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, the MTA, and served on its board for many years. The MTA, as many of you know, oversees the operations, planning, and financing of New York subways, buses, commuter railroads, bridges, and tunnels. He is former commissioner of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, the bi-state authority that operates the region's three major airports, all bridges, tunnels, port districts, and PATH commuter rail system. Currently, Peter Calico is chairman of the Grand Central Partnership, one of the largest and most successful business improvement districts in New York City, comprising 76 million square feet of commercial real estate in a 70-block area, and his company headquarters at 101 Park Avenue was one of the first new office developments in that area dating back to 1982, and I will add that it is now about, what, 97% occupied? 98. 98. <laughs> That's, I think, probably a post-COVID record for commercial real estate. Um, Mr. Calico serves on the board of the New York, New York Building Congress, an association committed to promoting the growth of the construction industry in the New York metropolitan region. From 1988 to 1994, as if that were not enough, Mr. Calico was the owner of the New York Post uh, and publisher. And this is the oldest daily newspaper in America, founded by Alexander Hamilton in 1801. Mr. Calico is involved in many philanthropic causes, and I'm just going to give you a few examples. He's a trustee of New York Presbyterian Hospital, where he serves as a vice chairman and member of the board's executive committee. Peter and Mary Calico Founders Lobby, as well as the Peter and Mary Calico Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, recognize the Calico's deep commitment to that institution. Mr. Calico is also a founding trustee of the Museum of Jewish Heritage at Battery Park in New York City, and has served on the board of the Jewish National Fund. The Peter and Mary Genealogy, Calico Genealogy Research Center at the museum is a tremendous resource and a testament to the Calico's deep interest in Jewish genealogy. Peter has served as trustee of Temple Emanuel in New York City, which established the Peter and Mary Senior Rabbinic Chair, also in honor of the Calicos. Along with many other awards, Mr. Calico was presented with the Peace Medal, Israel's highest civilian award for his many years in aiding that nation's development. In November 2008, Mr. Calico was honored with the Commendatore in the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic, one of the highest honors bestowed by the government of Italy. And Mr. Calico is widely recognized as a cultural ambassador because of his economic and philanthropic efforts as they relate to Italy. Finally, and I would say most importantly, Mr. Calico is a member of the Board of Trustees of Oxford University and was awarded an honorary doctorate of law by Oxford in 1986, and he received Officers Alumni of the Year Award in 1988. And as you heard, a major gift by Mr. Calico in 2015 established the Peter S. Calico School of Government, Public Policy, and International Affairs at Hofstra University. And this follows Mr. Calico's prior gifts, creating the Calico Center for Study of the American Presidency and the Calico Chair in Presidential Studies. Now, there is much more to say about Peter Calico, the impact that he has had at this university, and in so many civic and policy arenas, and the scores of awards, honors, and recognitions he's received for his work and for his generosity. But we want to hear about these things from him, not from me, um, and that, of course, is the purpose of today's program. So I will end by thanking Peter for his support and for all that he has done, and for being here today 
uh, to share his experience with our students. Thank you. I get the first question, so we're going to do this like a fireside chat. With the fireside. <laughs> okay, Peter. Yes. Uh, you are completing a comprehensive book documenting the 100 year anniversary of the Calico Company, right? As I said, started in 1925. Um, would you tell us how the company got started? Um, it's a funny story here, too. You know. My grandfather came to this country in 1894. Young man, nothing. His family came over a little later. The work ethic was a big thing for him. He learned the clothing business, which was the easy entry business to be in. And he was very good at it. He was what my father used to call master of detail and planning. Well, if you see anybody in the school who talks about the labor movement in America, when he came in, there was no unions of, of any consequence. And every time, they would add a, another layer of issue for workers' rights, well deserved, by the way. He would tell my grandmother, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. It's too hard. I'm going to the real estate business. My grandmother would say, well, why don't you think about that for a while? And as he was successful in the clothing business, he would invest in buildings. And his famous line was, how hard could it be? Well, it was very hard, but he was very good at it. And he did six or eight buildings, left, left the clothing business, 25, I think, six or eight buildings. In 1932, he was down to one building, in one piece of property. That was what the crash of 29 did. And his line was, which I'll never forget, people would come to him and say, Joe, how could you be affected? You were never in the market. And he would say, I wasn't, but my tenants were. Which was a thought that I remembered, knowing that building is a three-legged stool that requires the owner, the tenant, and the financing. And they all are important, but they won't succeed. Um, learned a lot from him. He was, um, I don't know, tough guy. They were pain in the ass. But <laughs> he has, I guess he was a time. And the other thing I learned, as I knew about it but not really understanding it, is the role that the Calico women have played in the company. Now, normally you would think, well, you know, his grandfather came and that was the end of it. But um, my grandmother was a big help to him in picking places for him to build his apartment house. Um, my mom, I tell people, she didn't know the difference between a mortgagee and a mortgagor, but she knew more about real estate than most people that I know. And whenever I was in a problem, she'd be my first go-to. What should I do about this problem? My wife, Mary, who, um, just wonderful, been married for 52 years, and um, <laughs> one thing I want to remember, tell you about Mary. After I sold the post, which Rick Nasty will attest of, like, was one of my happiest days ever, <laughs> um, I, was, I was being interviewed by somebody uh, at the Times or somebody, and they said, would you ever buy another paper again? And I said, are you kidding? I wouldn't do that again for all the money in the world. Mary said to me, Peter, you should never have said that. I said, what, Mary? She said, because you're taking yourself out of play as a wheel. If they think you might buy a paper, you're somebody. And that's when I started really listening to her and following her advice. Um, my sister Penny, who was also one of my silent advisors, um, great help to me. But now, the happiest moment of my life is my daughter is now the head of the company. And um, I was having dinner, lunch with her, a few of my aunts and their children. And Catherine, my daughter, went to the bathroom. And they said, you know, Julia, and my mom, told me one day Catherine's going to be running this company. Um, 
You know, remember all this stuff you think about now, big deal. But that was a big deal then for women to be running big companies. And um, it has given me a pleasurable way of easing myself out from the, from the job, which is a hard job. Um, I used to work 60, 70 hours a week. We will attest to that. He had all full hair when he started working with that. <laughs> but um, it just enabled me to ease out, having Rick there to help with the aircraft, my daughter, my sister. And it makes me feel good. I don't know how to say it. I get choked up thinking about it sometimes. But that's the Calico women. And I'll clean up the, the line I would give you. Don't fool with them. And fool was not to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk about Hofstra. Oh. I call myself the transition Hofstra graduate. When I came here, the school was a college. Everything was south of Hempstead Turnpike. Beautiful architectural symmetry. But it was still small. Um, it was locally known, but that was that. When I graduated in 65, we became a university. Um, we became nationally known. There was one thing I forgot. It'll come to me. But the north side. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Where we are now it used to be an Air Force base. And it's now on North Campus. So it's a big change in the years that I was here. And I know this may sound corny to you, but I was grateful for the education I got here. Because being a student uh, in a formal basis was never my strong suit. But I graduated. And the school was great to me. And I remember that. And one of the two of the things that I did was I went into business because I knew that that was where I was going to end up. But it was always political science that interested me. And I always wanted to make sure that we could do something in the political arena. So we did. Three debates. No other small schools had three debates. Um, we're a nationally known school, and our graduates are known in all the parts of government. One of my favorite guys is Phil Shalero. Even though he wrote Obamacare, I still like him. But he's a Hofstra graduate. And um, it's the thing that the students now have the ability to have him and Larry Fleischer, uh, Howard Dean, who ran for president, um, Ed Rollins, who ran Reagan's both campaigns. I always would say, these are the people I would like to have been here when I was a student. And that is what formatted what I wanted to do here. Mina was great. Susan's good. Susan uh, was also a great help. But I don't think we're not, we're not, we're not considered a, uh, just a local school anymore. We have a national reputation. Did you want to mention who your commencement speaker was? Yeah, that's my last thing. So <laughs> my, my, our commencement speaker was Juan Luther King, you don't understand, in 1965, what a guy this guy was. He, was. he was one of the most important political figures in the country. It was our president, was, uh, was came from Columbia, and he got up to speak here. And you have to remember, my graduating class was what I call the Vietnam class, because most of us were drafted, the, the men, anyway. And when Martin Luther King started talking about unfair war, everybody in the audience said, yeah, we agree with you. We like that. But he was just an amazing guy. And my favorite story is, as he's walking away to his car, I couldn't believe it. He didn't have a 20-person entourage. My father said, go over and say hello to him. I said, I don't want to. Harold said, go over. Well, that was to give you a And I went over. I spoke to him, and he spoke to me for five or ten minutes. He asked me what I did. What about the draft? I said, I'm, any minute I'm going to be uh, eligible. And the other two things I remember about him, I know this is petty, but I remember, 
is how short he was and the booming voice that he had. I don't think the guy ever needed a microphone. Um, so I always had a soft spot in, 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 my, in my life for Dr. King. There was somewhere in my sister's archive a picture of me and Dr. King, and nobody could seem to find it. We're going to send Perry to look for it, and I bet you she'll find it. Um, Perry is a graduate of the school who was the driving force behind the Calico 100 yearbook. And I'm proud to say that was my personal assistant. So she'll do a great job, I hope. I think that's a perfect example of what research can lead to. Oh, because yeah. Perry and another student who's at Hofstra Law now, Alexa, started going to archives in your, um, your records to produce, I have the proofs here, the 100 Years of Excellence. It will be a book soon. Oh, and the first of the year. You know, company lore. The company was founded in 1927. That's what my father told me. That's what I told the world. Well, everyone wasn't happy with that. She found that the first bill that Joe Calico bill was in 25. So um, usually I find when I hear stories about my contemporaries in the real estate business, when they founded their companies, most of them were still in Russia when they founded their companies. Or, or, or wherever they came from. But I tried to be honest, so we went to 27. But it was really 25. And um, families are important. I want you to know that. And, and Hofstra is a family too to me. And I really feel that way about you guys. So I'm ready. <laughs> well, I think, um, Peter, I so appreciate your comments about women and leadership in real estate. Uh, you met the students in my seminar, some of whom are here, on um, women in the White House, first lady, vice president, president, question mark, but someday. And um, you're long, you have studied the presidency for a long time. You were a business major, but I think you said you, in 1964, you were at Hofstra, you were really interested in the election. I, I, had, I had a very interesting thing at Hofstra. My finance teacher was Professor Song. He was the only guy that I knew then that was for Goldwater. So let you know. And my economic teacher was Professor Zaccone. So what I used to do was go to the economic class, listen to what she had to say, and then I would bounce it off to him, hear what he had to say, and bounce it off to her. And she probably thought I was the smartest person she ever met. <laughs> But yeah, it, and it, was, it also taught me that you need to get both sides. You just can't get one side. So that was, that's another thing that Hofstra has given me. Okay. Well, you, then, you expanded, uh, I think, Nina's question was about the presidency, but eventually in supporting uh, the Calico School, um, you expanded it to include public policy and international affairs. What, what made you grow the sort of subject matter of our first debate. And I said, you know, we have to get a school of government. Because that will be the centerpiece of all that we do in the political arena at the university. So we sat down with people who were here, people who were not here, or then, and we came up with a plan. And the gravitas of the debates are what gave us the ability to really have the nerve to do a school like that. And um, I'm very proud of it. But it's also interesting to know that, not that I want to tell you how great I am, but I am a Republican, but I don't let it get in my way. And I learned that from my dad. Um, he said, you've got to know both sides and you've got to listen to both sides. So that's what gave me the right or the ability to have a guy like Howard Dean as one of our fellows, uh, Phil Shalero, a graduate, who are both real Democrats. They're not fake Democrats, they're real Democrats. But I had Larry Fleischer and Ed Rollins, too. And I was always very proud of the fact that uh, Dr. Bozen and her staff, starting with Stewart and Susan, we always got both sides, of course. Um, if I may now, I'll probably get myself a little jam. 
much. But if you see what's going on today, we have only allowed to have one side of an argument? I've never heard of that. Um, American universities pride themselves on having both sides. And if you only have one side of the story, you can only get half the story. So I would advise my successors, and you guys out there, who will one day be running these places. You need to hear both sides. Very important. Peter, if I can pick up on that. Um, you've studied the presidency. You've met many presidents um, through real estate, through working at the MPA, through the New York Post, which we'll get to. But could you share um, some of your impressions? Maybe of, I, I know you've met uh, Bill Clinton, Richard Nixon. You have views on Lyndon Johnson. And you and I frequently discuss who are the top presidents and why. Would you share? Um, me and I do that all the time. We have, <laughs> we have our top ten list. Um, I will. I will say, I met President Reagan, President Johnson. I'll say President Kennedy, but it was a really short time. I'll tell you about the story. This is in 1960, um, October. Kennedy's in New York for his final wrap up of the campaign. My father, who was a kind of wheel in the Democratic Party. And he said, because he didn't like Kennedy, by the way. He said, you like Kennedy, right? I said, yeah. I was home for the weekend. He said, you want to meet him? I said, yeah. He takes me to a thing for uh, all of the Department of Sanitation that has they have meetings in them. And we got there, and because of my dad being a wheel, I'm at, we're at the top of the staircase as presidents walk through, as Kennedy walks through. And I know this is ridiculous to say, but if you ever saw a Kennedy in person, you would not believe. It was like watching a movie stuff. I mean, he was a dreary gray day, and here's this guy with kind of reddish brown hair and big smile, shaking hands with everybody. Um, it's a thing I'll never forget. It was a, 60 years, it was a, 1960 was a long time ago, but I'll never forget that. And he was also wearing uh, loafers, non lace shoes. I found that later, which was in his back issue. He couldn't wear those lace up shoes. Um, so that's Kevin. Johnson I met twice. My dad was on some commission that he appointed him to. Um, as time goes on, I dislike Johnson. I didn't dislike him initially, even though he was the cause of my being drafted. Um, but well, the more I found out about him, and there's a good friend of mine named Robert Carroll, who wrote, who has written the definitive um, Johnson bios. And he and I had this fight, because he liked Johnson. I said I didn't like him. I said I thought he was, uh, uh, he went into war for his own person, uh, goals, not for the country's goals. And that's like a bad thing. Um, it also gave me a view of presidents, which is interesting. I love having a president who has once been shut out by the enemy. Because it gives him a different perspective of sending guys in to war, as Kennedy did in the Bay of uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. He was, he was like nine to one, nine to one to invade Cuba, and he was the one, and we didn't invade. And that's because I believe he was under fire um, Johnson said he was under fire. I don't believe it. That's just me. Um, but I always thought that was a good thing. Harry Truman was under fire. Frank Rosa was not under fire. But um, I think it gives them a, a bit of thinking. The other presidents I met were Nixon and Clinton. And why Vita brings up them is they were my two favorite guys. Forget about them as president. They were just such a pleasure to be with. I mean, you could go out to dinner with Clinton, and we were talking about, I, I can't remember the year, I'll make it up, 81, two. He says, you know, in the Iowa 3rd District, I'm saying to myself, how does he know what the Iowa 3rd District was? But he gives you all that stuff. And the guy that was better than that was Nixon. Um, we invited Nixon to come down to the Post to do an editorial board. And he came, said, I can only stay a half hour. We said, fine, Mr. President, thank you. 
It was 11 o'clock. He left at 4.30. He was having such a good time. And what I found amazing about him was he spent as much time with the sports editors as he did with the regular reporters. And he knew as much about sports as most of them did. Um, but, you know, there's a flaw in him, which I understand. But I like him. He was a nice man, nice to me. Um, Reagan was my least favorite friend. He, he didn't warm up to me or whatever it is. He didn't like me, but I didn't get a, a vibe with him. Um, my, up in the top good list, let's say, was George Bush. And when I spoke to George Bush, he spoke to me. I think of us. He was in every job in the government you could have, starting with being shot down as a Navy pilot in World War II. He was a congressman, he ran for the Senate from Texas, he was CIA director, he was ambassador to China, he was vice president, he was everything you could be. That is due to his family service history. And no matter how much money you guys make, whatever you, you do, you should devote a portion of your time to public service. Because it makes you a better man and it will be the things you look back on as you get older in life. Making money is great, but not the, not the greatest thing in the world. Um, so, I'm trying to remember who else I met. Who? Obama. Ford? Ford? No. Carter? Yeah, I met Carter. Jesus, that, that, that was a letdown. He, was never, he lived down to my expectations. Uh, but he was a very nice man. And um, he had a principal, I, I would say. Of course, I could leave out my closest friend, President, who was uh, a 45th president, President Trump. No booze, please. Um, I boo him as much as you do. But um, he was an interesting man. And again, it says what, it, what aided me in my dealing with him, to be honest with you, was the knowledge that I had of our past relationships that presidents had with the Congress and their government. So I used to try to explain that to him, and then I just gave up. But nevertheless, uh, the most, the guy who disappointed me the most is our present president. Um, he was, a, a, he said, I'm pro life. I said, okay. He said, Catholic, he's another pro life. But he wasn't. He said, I'm pro Israel. I said, that's nice, you know, because we got a lot of supporters from Israel. But she was not. He said, I'm not a liberal. I'm a, Real center of the road conservative, which he wasn't. And I believe because of Trump and um, um, not so much Nixon, but Trump and, and, and uh, Biden, I think they put us in the pickle we're in now. Um, let me just tell you another story about one of our officials. Al D'Amato was a U.S. Senator from New York State for 18 years. A very good friend of mine before he was in the Senate. So I was kind of his campaign chief. So once in a while, I would go down to Washington to talk to him. And of course, I like to eat the Senate dining room. Senators don't like eating it because the food sticks. But I like it. And he's there with a, he's on the floor negotiating some bill with a Senator, I believe it was Deacon Cini, from Alabama, Arizona, a Republican. A Democrat. So far, I got a vote for him. Um, he was talking and talking and back and forth. And in the Senate, one of the ways you, you're nasty is you say, well, if my esteemed colleague would understand. And that's a, a level of conversation. I get a note passed up from this guy to meet him in the dining room, which I did. Who's in it sitting and having lunch with him? He can see me. So I'm sitting there during the lunch having to keep my mouth shut because I'm dying to say, all right, explain that to me. He said, the way politics works is you've got to get along with the other guy. Because if you can't get along with him, nothing is ever going to happen. And again, something we are missing today. 
Um, they have one of our congressmen from uh, Green. This is Green. She said, if you have one thing that you gave the Democrats, I'm going to impeach you. What kind of nonsense is that? Why would a guy give you anything if you know that if he gives you one thing, it's going to be the end of the world? And I think they need some more of those guys that have been in business. Because in business, you never get everything you want. Um, and modestly, one of my success, success stories was as MTA chairman. I had a um, Democratic assembly. I had Democratic governors. I had Republican governor too. But you better give something to the other guy or you don't get anything. So it's, it's, Trump should have known that because he was in business. Biden, I can't account for. But I just don't like the, the place we're at today. It really bothers me. And so, how do you think we got there? I mean, you were mentioning people like H.R. Bush and you know, people on both sides of the aisle, Clinton, who had their differences, but it wasn't like this. Why, why are we where we are today? I think those men, starting with Franklin Roosevelt, you know, he was, was a politician of immense work, they knew how to talk to the other guy. They knew how to give them something that was easy to do. Remember, Franklin Roosevelt, whatever you want to say about it, his Democratic majority in the Senate was all from the South, which means you have no majority, because they're not interested in anything that Franklin Roosevelt wanted. But he managed to get him to do it. He did it with Republican help. Nobody was uh, uh, ashamed of that. Lyndon Johnson, even though I didn't dislike them, I remember distinctly when he had to go to I can't remember. Who was the Republican leader? Dirksen. Dirksen. He had to go to Dirksen. A famous story I'll tell you later. He invites Dirksen on the, he calls, calls him on the phone. And you just have seen him on the Senate TV or radio they had that. He said, Everett, he said, I wouldn't talk to my least favorite dog the way he was talking about me. Dirksen starts laughing because he knows that's Johnson's way. He said, can you come over and talk to me about something? Oh, absolutely, Mr. President. Six o'clock. Gets over there at six. He needed civil rights. He told Hubert Humphrey, he said, you know, Hubert, it's no big deal to be from civil rights if you're from Minnesota. That's easy. You try to be from civil rights if you're from te Texas or Al Gore's father's uh, Tennessee. But he needed, I forget how many votes. And this is the part of politics which you may not like, but it's the part that works. So Dirksen comes over, and they're talking, and Dirksen says, you know, there are three guys, who, two guys, one for the Federal Communications Commission, and one for another commission. In, in Washington, they have a equally divided Republicans and Democrats on all the commissions, and the chairman is the chairman who controls the, uh, the, part of the, the body. So he mentioned these two guys, and then when Johnson started talking about the poor people who can't vote, you know, in Mississippi and Alabama, and they never said anything else, except Dirksen leaves, he knows his two guys are going to get named, and Johnson knows he's got, I forget, the 15 Republicans, he needed to pass the civil rights bill. Could you imagine doing that today? They would impeach him if he did that today. But that's how it worked, that's how the stuff got done. So, uh, you, you guys had the benefit of me uh, remembering this stuff in the 60s and seeing it in these 20s and to know how terrible I feel about it. I'm ready. Can I, um, I'm going to come back to the MTA because I want to skip ahead to the New York Post because as you speak about what's changed, Peter, um, and you can't blame technology, but certainly the media world has changed in a good way. Yeah. And I wonder if you could share a little bit about your time, why you decided to enter journalism, um, why you left, and, and what's changed. Well, I talk about journalism, 
I entered the journalism was a hallucination that I was having. But it was, it's not so. Uh, journalism was something I was always interested in. Um, not so much the writing or the picking of stories, but the influence the newspapers had on politics. In those days, TV was a very small item. When I came in, it was just about changing. So I wanted to be involved in it. Had I known what I did, I don't know if I'd have done it again, but I did. My father had a great story with my father. He had, he had a, a card game with eight, eight guys, and they rotated. The wives would go somewhere, and these guys play cards one, one day away. And they were all except for one World War II veterans. They had one guy who was um, landed on D-Day. He actually did. He landed the day after, but it's just as good. So I said to him, what did you think about that? Your, your experience as a, as a member of the 101st. He said, well, he said, when I look back on it, I like it. And I'm quoting. For 11 months, I was scared shitless. He said, war is a terrible thing. And you got six other guys here plus me, including your dad. And war is a very difficult thing. But I needed to know that there was more to life than just making money or being a Democrat or Republican. That's what the paper did, did for me. Um, I tried to run it legitimately, meaning all the stories were done by the professional news staff. Um, I did the with my editorial editor, Rick, the editorials, which is actually the province of the owner of the paper. And I kind of liked it, but it got too difficult. Um, we found out one thing, that three newspapers in New York were never going to make it. And that there was one guy they were worried about, actually, is the Post. Of course, New York Newsday is gone. New York Daily News is gone, essentially, and the Post is still there. But for me, it wasn't so easy. Um, but it was interesting, and I got to meet people I never would met, people who had different views than me, and people who I wanted to talk to about. I had, we had a lunch with the chairman of the ACLU. Um, if you can think of anybody different than me, than him, you probably can't. But we had a lot of things in common. And he was the one that told me about you need to have an opposition. He said, if everything was my way, I couldn't have an organization. I need opposition. It makes me more on my toes, on my game. And that's what makes America great. Um, you know, you had uh, George Moore, I mean, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And, you, and the two of them, you had Aaron Barr. One day you'll probably the story about Aaron Barr, what a guy he was. But <laughs> you, you need opposition. You can't live without him. And um, part of the, 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 um, the Dems' problem, which is the election in 46, they hadn't governed in 18 years. They didn't have to do it. They got the House for one term. Didn't get the Senate. You need, you need opposition. You can't live without it. And I like when majorities go back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. If there was all one party, you'd have no country. Um, well, so you've talked at sort of at the federal level about the presidents and um, uh, talked about sort of politics in general. Can you share some of your experiences uh, at the state level uh, with the M working at the MTA, Port Authority, and other things that you did um, at, at that level? Um, my two favorite governors were Mario Cuomo and George Pataki. Um, George Pataki, uh, Mario Cuomo wanted Rick because they needed a Republican for the MTA. And he said to me, could he keep when he hears at the meetings, out of the newsroom. I said, absolutely. Uh, 
He doesn't want to go to the newsroom unless he talks to me first. And Rick was at the MTA. I learned a lot about it, even though I was published with a paper. I would ask him about how the MTA worked. When I sold the post, the next day I got a phone call from Mario Paul. He said, Peter, you got nothing to do, right? <laughs> I said, well, maybe. He said, I want you back in government. I want you on the MTA. I said, OK. And I was on the MTA. And on it, you learn more about how it works. And sometimes had the genius of our forefathers work to make the two-party system work. But um, being with him was a pleasure. I liked it. Um, my paper used to beat the hell out of him every Tuesday. Tuesday was um, the guy from Walden, Fred Dickers. And I would know when I'd walk in on Tuesday morning, there'd be an 805 message on my desk, Governor Cuomo called. You know. But I like him, and I, I think he respected that I've got a lot of columnists, especially, say what he wants. Um, but when I was chairman of the MTA, most people thought I did a good job. And my secret weapon was George Pataki. He never called me to do something, ever. Never put it in on anything that I was doing. And some things, remember, this is a guy. And he appreciated that I understood the value of subways. And a guy from Garrison, New York, doesn't understand that. So when I told him what we needed for the subways and the commuter reels, he was OK. And never gave me a hard time. So, and I consider that, unfortunately, the governor died, but um, Jackie and I are still close friends. And I'm still close friends with Andrew Cuomo. Um, a side gossip story. There was a newspaper column with Mike McAlary. And he wanted to come work for the Post. Who's his lawyer? Andrew Cuomo. And I didn't know Andrew that well. Who was, was the bar on 42nd Street? Yeah, there's a daily news bar. And we made the deal then. I don't drink, but we made the deal later. <laughs> um, and, and these are Democrats, guys. And I'm supposed to be a Republican. But I had no problem working with them. And it was, it made things happen. Okay, East Side Access and Second Avenue Subway happened because you had Democrats backing it. And when, when I went to the archives, I got the first MTA book out, the uh, annual report. And they're talking about the, this is 75, about this great new project, bring the Long Island Railroad into Penn Station. The race of this thing. It only took 50 years to do it, right? <laughs> but the point was that when you have one sided government, stuff like that doesn't get done. So you need two sided government, no question about that. We have many more questions. I, I'm wondering if we could just conclude with one about philanthropy, which ties into public service, and then maybe we could open it up because I think students will have a lot to ask. We've been talking a lot about the presidency, public policy making, um, political advocacy in these classes. So, Peter, could you maybe share a little bit about um, why you've chosen the organizations you have um, for philanthropy, including Hofstra, of course? <laughs> Well, Hofstra is the easy one, but um, not, my grandfather was fairly philanthropic, more than I thought. Thank you to Perry for finding it out for me. My dad was okay. But when I started to make a lot of money, I said, okay, something more in life than money. I remember reading stories before there was a tax code. American rich people were philanthropic in supporting hundreds of institutions, which are still around today. And before the tax code, remember, all they did was give the money and get no benefit for it, other than self self esteem. And I, I, I went along with it. I liked that. And so the easiest one for me to do was how was my alumni. Um, um, the second one I did was New York Presbyterian Hospital because they did wonders for my son when he was young and relatively ill. 
So those are the two easy ones. Um, Temple Emmanuel, of course, that's not sure It's the largest Jewish house of worship in the world. And when I say that, with a kind of a North Pole remark, is that's thanks to the Germans that wrecked most of the ones in Eastern Europe. But nevertheless, it is the largest one. And, and I like that. Um, it's a matter of, uh, I can't let, religion didn't enter into my thinking, <coughs> the posture, or do the Presbyterian. Um, now, the other part of me that you need to know is my interest in the Holocaust. Sadly, I'm starting to see too many things today give me a bad feeling, but I'll go into that another time. Um, my generation was the first generation that was interested in doing Holocaust memorials. My dad's generation, they didn't do it. And I once asked him, once, he told me once, said, we thought we were next, the American Jews. So I could give him a buy that. But I did the Holocaust, when you start to think about it as people. Um, I had a woman that I knew who was um, French, 10 years old. She had two brothers that went in the underground. <coughs> parents did their other thing. And they put her in a convent. Now, for those. Catholics in the room, the mother superior <coughs> signed a baptismal certificate for this new woman. Now that's a, in, in German, German control of France, that's a hanging offense. But she did it anyway. And I said, you know, these stories don't come out of them. Um, so, George Klein, fellow Bill and Ryan, decides he wants to do one in New York. And I said, I'm in jail, George. Um, and it built up. Bob Walker then got involved, and then we really started knocking the desk. Um, but remember that anti-Semitism is not something that's new. What you're seeing today, I grew up with that. Um, I didn't like it, but I got through it. And what I found was the purveyors of it are generally the most bigoted, unintelligent people in the world who don't understand about history. Read the history of Adolf Hitler. He was a brilliant guy. They don't understand how you're going to read Russia and America at the same time. I mean, if you're eight years old, you know that. So it's that kind of thing that got me into the Holocaust Museum. There's a side story about that. Um, uh, when my father wanted to go back to Russia to visit his parents' hometown, grandparents' hometown, actually. We were doing a, a, a deal with the Russian government for a building somewhere. My father asked the guy, can, I, can you get me back? He said, there's nothing left. All right, the, all the records were destroyed. By working with the Clarsfelds on documenting the Holocaust, we found out that all of the reports that were from all over Europe, were taken back by the Russians and put in the Kremlin, basement. Now, Rick Nasty sitting here, and he has a, uh, his partner in crime with me, Dan Kravitz. So Dan Kravitz is Irish, good friend of mine, so I don't know. Um, and he can go to the Cork or the Scabrini church. He get his whole family going back to God's life. Then I see Rick go say, look at his dad. The big thing about Sienna, not Sienna, Sienna, for me and Nancy, his whole family going back to God knows what. What have I got? I got nothing. Um, I, whatever I got, I found that was wrong anyway. But um, the records that Yeltsin may avail God bless him. Um, Putin put a stop to it. But we had gotten 
lots of the records for the building of Auschwitz and some of the other um, uh, death camps, as well as family histories. Um, genealogy is like a big thing today. It was impossible to do back when I was younger. But because Yeltsin opened that up, a few people I meet, we started this thing called Jewish Chat, which allows me to be like Mike and Rick, because I can find my history, which I did. They traced my family back to 1812. I could have gone further, but that would have been another layer. For me, to have 1812 was like a big deal. And what else we found out was they all lied about their, about they lied when they came here, they lied at who they were married to, but it's all kinds of things. But it was interesting. So we have a thing now, and I gave it to the museum, the Holocaust Museum in Battery Park. You can find that in your whole family history. Did you imagine that? And that's again, that's what lit my fire when I knew that I couldn't find out until then. So, yeah, that's one of the reasons that I got involved in, in a big way. Well, I think it's nice to conclude our comments here with archives and documents and records because that's really what underlies so much of everything that you've created at Hofstra with presidential studies and the Calico School. Why don't we open it up for questions? We have two microphones here. Um, if the students, don't be shy. In my presence in class, we can talk a lot about presidential ratings. You can question some of what we've been studying, or with the other classes as well, public policy and civic engagement, please come up and ask. You know what I found? If one guy comes up, <laughs> the floodgates. Go, Justin. <laughs> Thank you. You're the first of many, I hope. Hi, um, I'm Justin. I'm in a uh, professor in Moses' class. And um, you spoke about how Lyndon B. Johnson made you feel when he deployed a lot of your friends and people in mm -hmm. Vietnam. Yes. Do you feel that he was kind of out of touch with the youth at that time, especially in comparison to his predecessor, John F. Kennedy? Okay. If you get to know me, buddy, you know I, I talk my mind. His out of touch was his good thing. He went in the war because he was afraid that Robert Kennedy would beat him in 1968. And that's, there's no other reason than that. And the more I read about it, and the more now it's, of course, it's come out. So, yeah, that's why he did it. And what we found out was really terrible is if anybody here knows the story of Vietnam, the Gulf of Tonkin incident was made up. Could you imagine that? 55,000 American young men dead on a made up story? All right, that's why you got to bring light to history. One way I said, sunshine is the best disinfectant there is, and I believe that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> Others? I've never seen, I have so many students at this school. You're never shy. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Um, I was just wondering, as someone so involved and informed um, with American politics for many decades at this point, um, how are you feeling about the upcoming election, and what do you think are going to be the major factors that will kind of decide it? Well, to be honest with you, I'm not happy about it. Um, and sadly, the major factors, we, they found out something. That when I was involved with presidential and senatorial campaigns, pollsters run the world. They tell these guys what to say. And when that happens, you got nothing. And that's what we have now. Uh, they think it's good that they find something to pin on the other guy. And I don't think that's a good idea. How are you going to work with these guys? You know? So that's pulling us apart. Um, I will tell you that I am very disappointed about it. And just to stick up for myself, the two sh new shows I watch Lester Holt and Fox. And you'd be surprised at the different view you get from both. But I'm okay with it. In fact, I know Lester Holt 
because one of my editors at the Post, Jerry Dackman, hired him at NBC. Um, so, yeah, I'm okay with that. But I, I wish everybody else would do what I do. Remember they used to, the old days, they used to read every paper because it was Republican and Democratic papers. Nobody does that anymore. So, I'm, I'm, in the end, I'll be an optimist, I promise you, because that's my life. But I'm very disappointed about it now. And just one other question. Um, I understand that you're a Ferrari enthusiast. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering um, what your um, favorite car is as of late, and if you drove it here today. Uh, <laughs> drove it here, though. Um, they change, but I'm going to give you today. In my garage, in my house, I have a 1962 Ferrari Super America, a 22 A12. Um, an 06, what I call a Kappa, that was a one off made for me. And, what was the other one? Oh, um, one that was made for the wife of the king of Belgium. They called the Princess the Rathic Cars. Um, but that'll change. By the time I go to Toronto, it'll be three, four different cars. <laughs> and no, I didn't drive it here today. I used to drive it every day. Um, Parking is a pain in the ass. <laughs> I know. And um, <coughs> I'm not as mobile as I used to be. So I gotta find a place close in like it's park. Thank you very much. Wonderful time. company. That was a good question. <laughs> you know, we've been hostile, we have a we don't have a parking problem, we have a walking problem, but we'll give you a pass on that. <laughs> I, was part of the, I was part of the walking problem. <laughs> Hello. Um, I have a question for your time on college shows. Do you ever wish that you got more involved in the Union of Science Department and then like after graduation that you were more involved with politics? Like do you see yourself more as a public politician or do you wish that you were? Um interesting answer to your question. I was involved with politics. We didn't have particularly great political science department. So I would, by gossip, find professors like Zaccone and so take their classes knowing that they're going to get reviews that may not be my views. I always liked that. Read all the papers. Um, I was um, a fan of Walter Cronkite, so I didn't have to watch any of the news shows. But um, <coughs> what I've done for the school because I made it easier for a guy like me back then to get involved. And it's easy. You got a, you got a great guy like, like Dr. Bose here, and it's, she makes it wonderful for you. And I will tell you, I've never yet met a group of our students that didn't impress me with their knowledge of the situations in the world. So I was very happy. My name is Arianna. Um, my question to you is, with your experience running the New York Post and your views on politics, was it hard running stories that you didn't agree with? And what was your experience considering you've met a lot of powerful people? What, what agreements did you say? I'm sorry. I'm sorry? I'll just repeat the question. Okay. Uh, with your views running the New York Post and your views on politics, was it hard running stories that you didn't agree with fully? Oh. And was it... Was your experience, you know, how was your experience considering you've met a lot of powerful people? Okay. The answer was it was relatively easy because I had some great editors. And I would talk to them. Their word was the final one. Jerry Nackley used to say, my job will not be done until I have all of your friends not talking to you. That was, that was, that was his, his way. But yeah, I didn't interfere, and I'll tell you why. It made life easy for me. I didn't have to justify anything. I said, I got a great staff, I'm not going to tell them what to do. Now, editorials, yeah, I'm okay with that. I'm entitled to tell them what, what I think should be going on here. But not on straight news. And we were very good on it. For those six years, Morgan and Johnson was president, by the way, um, we, were, we were pretty on the money on news. Well, my follow-up would be, you know, considering today's 
yeah. situation, current events, um, specifically politically speaking. How would you feel, like how do you feel about what's been happening in terms of CNN and the situations resonating to the scandals happening with Trump and the election? Um, I can tell at Hofstra who their liberal is. And it's just one or two or three people out of hundreds of them. CNN has just gone down, in my opinion. And I will tell you, news, NBC News, that was my gold standard. And when they fired Ronnie McDaniel, I thought that was dumb. I didn't know why I thought it was dumb. See, I had Howard Dean and Rollins here, and I had both presidential campaigns covered for you guys to be able to ask that. If you only had one of them, you don't, you don't know what went on. So I don't know how you could run a news network and only have one guy, one side. Impossible. And that's getting worse. Part of the problem with, with the uh, fictional, factualism that we have now outside is due to the, to the so-called major media, media outlets not being unbiased. Thank you. I appreciate it. We have time for one more question. Oh, please. I just had a question. Um, being someone who's uh, generated a lot of wealth, um, one of my personal role models is Chuck Feeney, someone who made billions of dollars and gave a lot of it away. Can you just speak to the responsibility as someone who's generated a lot of money to be philanthropic and give the money away that you make in the end? The answer is, I'll give you the broad answer, but then I'll tell you the real answer. The broad answer is, this country has provided a platform for guys like me to make a lot of money. And keep it. You know, it's not, you don't have to worry about it. taking it away. Um, so I always thought that was great. Um, but the real reason is, down deep inside, I felt I owe some public good somewhere. I didn't do it all myself. I had 10,000 employees building these buildings. I didn't build them myself. So I, need, I, I want to make sure that I can exert some um, influence. One of the things that I should tell you, there's a scholarship here in my name. And I enjoy sometimes reading the letters of the recipients that write me. <coughs> I don't have any idea who I am. I know that much. But it's nice to see. And yeah, the answer is, we have to do that more. And the guys that make all those billions have more of a responsibility to do it. OK, well, um, let's uh, thank Peter Calico again for this really